Welcome to Talking Africa on Arise News, a special weekly edition of Africa Wrap, where we take time to reflect on the fortunes and affairs of the emerging continent within its own countries and across the world. Well, time now to welcome Yasmin Bello Osagie, one of the co-founders of She Leads Africa, a social enterprise that supports the growth of African female business leaders. Yasmin has also been named as one of Forbes' 20 youngest power women in Africa. Yasmin, thank you very much indeed for coming in. It's a pleasure to have you on um, Talking Africa. Now, thank you. you're clearly someone who is considered a high achiever, but how did you get where you are? What was it that was the impetus mm -hmm. for you? Mm -hmm. So um, I think, you know, in terms of sort of getting where I am, it's sort of two things. I think one of them is really almost, you know, it's a, circumstance and chance and good luck um, and then I think that the other thing is just sort of around the opportunities that I think that I've been exposed to um, so you know for me growing up I mean first of all I had you know parents who were very particular about education so you know I always say that you know you could do pretty much anything you wanted in the house wrong but as long as you did well in school mm. like everything was going to be okay so I think from a very young age I mean I think you know achieving academically and then I think very closely linked to that professionally was always something that was really, really important for me. I think that that's not necessarily something that a lot of people on the continent get, especially mm. women. They don't necessarily have that support from their families to sort of say, you need to push yourself academically. So your parents spurred you on very and much encouraged so. you very, to, very much so. you know, not be concerned about barriers. Exactly. Basically, you can be all you that you can be. You can do be. anything it is that you want to do. Um, I think that I was very fortunate in that, you know, they were actually able to afford a very mm. good quality of education for me. So, you know, I started off at primary school in Nigeria. Um, then I was at boarding school in England for eight years. Um, and then I went to university in the States. Um, again, I think that, you know, so yes, there's the one hand of sort of saying you have the personality um, or you've been, you know, shaped mm. in such a way that it makes you want to achieve, but you also need the tools to actually achieve that success. And most of the times those tools come from, you know, having a really strong education, you know, which links to making sure you can get into a good university, which makes links into making sure that you get a really good first job. Mm. And all these things kind of matter. I think that there's like a little bit of a connection. And of course, you, you went on to study history and mm -hmm. finance at Princeton University. Why yep. did you choose to study those subjects? Um, okay, so I mean, I chose history just because I really, really love history. Um, I think, I mean, to me, I always say, like, I, actually, I don't read a lot of fiction, which probably isn't very good, but to me, what's so amazing about history is that, you know, they're all stories, but they, they actually happen. Mm. So you also feel like, like you're learning at the same time. I mean, not that you're not from fiction as well, but I mean, I've always really loved the fact about history that you, know, you see it, it's a crazy story, and you're like, wow, that actually happened. Um, in terms of finance, to be completely honest, you know, this is very much like the Nigerian African in me sort of saying, okay, wow, can I really just graduate with history? <laughs> so I was like, I mean, I think that in America it's pretty easy. I mean, in my mind it was in finance and it was like pretty easy to kind of like get the courses mm. together, like such that I was actually... Like, so you were a, you're a bit of a number with. cruncher then. Maybe. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, like I would say that you're, the mass part of your brain, it's like a muscle. So if mm. you don't flex it for a really long time, you kind of lose it. So I wanted to do something that made sure I was continuing need to kind of deal with like you know figures numbers and you know etc so you'd like to make a million dollars and then sit down and count it all <laughs> exactly you <laughs> want to make sure that you can keep track of everything properly right? tell us a bit about your time at Princeton what was it like um so I think I would say about Princeton I really I mean I loved it academically I mean I think I was coming from the UK system which a lot of the times I found a little bit rigid mm. Um, I think that the cool thing about America is that, I mean, sometimes it's almost like a little cheesy, but it's very much like, oh, you can do whatever you want to do, like think about this, you know, innovation. And so I think that it really sort of opened my mind academically to sort mm. of some of the things that I could do, what it is that I could be interested in, what are the things that, um, what are the sort of things that I would want to focus on in the end. Um, I would say socially it was a little bit tough. Um, you know, for my last two years of school, um, I was at a group of schools. I mean, it's, a, it's in Wales. It's called um, Atlantic College. It's mm. part of like a group of schools called the United World Colleges. And the whole idea about them is that, like, you know, very international, 200 students from like 75 different countries. You know, you're never in a dorm with like someone from like the same, you know, country mm. as you. And so to kind of go from that to I think Princeton, which is, you know, even amongst kind of the top schools, 
is quite, um, it can be quite American, mm. um, was a little bit tough for me, I think, like socially kind of readjusting. But I mean, I would make the same decision again because I think that really in terms of sort of an academic experience, it was like absolutely amazing, like yeah. great professors. No, absolutely. You know. I think that that's, um, most people would agree that that, mm -hmm. um, that, that would have been a, quite an extraordinary experience. Mm -hmm. But then you went from that history finance at Princeton to mm. attending the Cordon Bleu Culinary Institute in London and Paris yes. before working as a trainee chef in the Mandarin Oriental in Hong Kong. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an extraordinary A real move, like twist of, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I think where that came out of was that I sort of was a little worried or I felt that I'd been very, very much focused on academics pretty mm. much like my whole life. It was, I mean, like from the time I was a kid, my parents were like, very big on, you know, this leads to this leads to this, which leads to you getting into a mm. really good university, which a lot is of going Nigerian to determine, parents are exactly, that way, which is going they? to determine the rest of your life. And so I think I just wanted to do something different, something that was, you know, non-academic, something that would ha get me to explore, I think, a different side of my personality, like something that I hadn't really so done So what was before. that experience like? Um, what, what did you learn to cook? Okay, so, I mean, at the Cordon Bleu, of course, you learn a lot of, it's sort of like French cuisine. Mm. I mean, and because I wasn't there for that long, most of the focus is initially on kind of learning techniques. Mm. Um, and then you kind of like build in like content, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I mean, it was cool just to, I think, A, you get a really good view into the hospitality industry, mm. which is actually something that's really growing on the continent. Um, I think that the second thing is, from a skills point of view, one of the things that I really learned from working in the kitchen is sort of like learning how to work quickly and accurately under pressure. Because you know, you're in a kitchen, it's hot, there's like this there, there's this going on, there's so much going on, and you kind of need to make sure that everything you're doing is precise. You need to mm. make sure, I mean, really sharp knives, you need to be sort of very on the ball. And I think that that's actually something that served me really, really well when I sort of started my professional career. So, so you did all that, mm -hmm. and then went back to Nigeria yes. to work for McKinsey and Company in Lagos. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to move back? Did your father sort of lay down the law so no. after all that back to Nigeria so no they, not at all I think actually my parents have been pretty easy in terms of sort of mm. whatever I mean they let me you know go to culinary school so it's mm. very much like whatever you want but I mean I think that I always knew that I wanted to move back to Nigeria I think that you know this is a really amazing time to be young and African. If mm. I think about my parents' generation, like no one wanted to come to like Nigeria, right? It was just like, oh my God, what is this place? Mm. But you know, now I have friends from school, like friends who are based here, and they're all sort of saying, like, we know that like you know Africa and very much Nigeria is this new and exciting growth story. Like, mm. how can we be a part of that? And so I just sort of felt that you know, a from sort of like a, an opportunities perspective, I felt like it was much more interesting to be there. But I think that B, also from, you know, some sort of like, uh, I mean, I don't want to say a responsibility or a duty, but I think that, you know, for us who've been very fortunate to, I think, have a great education, it's really mm. kind of important for us to move back and make sure that as, you know, Nigeria is developing and it's growing and it's rising, or, you know, Africa, that it's actually developing in the right way. So, so you, you, you've now moved back to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. you, you've spent some time there. You've watched a political transition yes. take place in Nigeria. What would you say is the one area that needs needs to be worked on urgently. I know mm -hmm. you talked about education mm -hmm. earlier. I, I mean, to be honest, I would continue to, if there was one thing, I would continue to focus on education because, well, it's a toss up to be honest for me between education and power. Um, power being electricity. Power being ex exactly electricity. Because I mean, on the one hand, you know, as um, like young entrepreneurs, you see how difficult it is for entrepreneurs to operate when you essentially have to generate your mm. own power. It's just simply too expensive, and it strangles a lot of big, a lot of businesses. Now, on the other hand, you know, we actually, when we speak to entrepreneurs, and this is across the continent, a lot of them talk about sort of how difficult it is for them to find talent. Mm. And like you, an organization is not going to grow if you can't find the right talent. You know, as a manager, you know, there's only so much that you can do. There are only 24 hours in your day. So now if you're doing things which really in any other part of the world you wouldn't really be doing because that would have been, you know, sort of delegated to someone else, if you're not able to do that, then you don't really have the time to be thinking about some of the strategic issues which only you can do. Mm. Um, um, so I think that that education piece, it's, I, I don't see how we're going to develop if we don't have, I think, the right sort of people. Right. Yeah. OK, stay with us. We'll take a very short break here. But when we come back, we'll be talking to Yasmin about her social enterprise, She Leads Africa. Do stay with us.
Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News. Let's continue the conversation with my guest, Yasmin Bella Osagie, the co-founder of She Leads Africa, a social enterprise that provides the most talented female entrepreneurs across the continent with access to the knowledge, networks, and financing needed to build and scale strong businesses. Thank you for staying with us there. She Leads Africa is, a, is an ambitious statement. What's it all about? Um. So it's really all about saying that, you know, we keep hearing about this Africa rising story. And, you know, we really just want to make sure that women are part of that growth story. And, you know, one of the challenges that, you know, me and my co-founder found is that, you know, when a lot of people were thinking about, okay, how do you include African women in this growth story? There was, a, I think, a real focus on, you know, low-income women and sort of helping them. So, I mean, you hear a lot about sort of like microfinance, et cetera, mm. et cetera. But there really wasn't anyone who was saying, look, how do we actually make sure that we have African women in leadership positions. So whether that's in the business sector, in you know, I don't know, in the public sector, et cetera, et cetera, our focus has really been on saying, look, you know, we need to be finding the female Dangote or, you know, the female Mo mm. Ibrahim or sort of like anything. But we really kind of need to make sure that we have women creating very large businesses on the continent and making sure that um, they are in leadership positions in sort of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And are you encouraged by what you see happening at, for instance, the African Union Summit, which this year talks about women as the main theme, that that's what they're, they're hoping to focus mm. on there? Does that encourage you? Um, yes, encouraged, but I think almost optimistic, but cautiously optimistic. Because again, that I would, I would say that a lot of the focus really has been on sort of helping women set up micro businesses. Right. And of course, I think that that's needed, but we know that kind of small, medium, you know, large enterprises are really what become the engines of mm. um, an economy. So if we want to make sure that women are the ones who are really pushing the economy, then we need to have them not just, you know, sort of at the micro level, but really at the small and medium stage and definitely the large stage as well. Large stage as well. So I'd sort of be interested to see how the African Union is thinking about that and really sort of like making sure that, you know, because I think that when you sort of watch the news, you often, I think, get a very stereotypical view of African women, mm. right? It's, you know, microfinance, bas bas microfinance basket weaving, you know, maternal health, sure. malaria. You really don't see, I think, like the richness of the, um, or the diversity of experience. Um, and I think it'd be really, really important to like make sure that the African Union is actually staying true to that. So they're, you know, supporting women across the board, right. not just in a very specific segment. Now you started She Leads Africa while you were still working at McKinsey and mm -hmm. company mm -hmm. what inspired you to, to do that um, so I think you know at the sort of at that time in my life I'd been very much and I, I'd been in Nigeria for about a year and a half and I hadn't done that much that I think was socially driven and what so, sort of work were you doing at McKinsey and company um, so I briefly mean, I, I mean I was an analyst so I'm um, a consultant and I focused mainly in terms of function function very much on strategy so sort of mm. helping organizations develop long-term growth strategies and so you had this sudden sector, brainwave to do something for women did you? no actually it was more just it started off first as look I just want to do something that is giving back to society in some right. way. At the, at the time, I was actually doing a healthcare project. So I thought a lot about, you know, sort of maybe it's around like cancer awareness and something about that. Um, and then I was actually at a conference, um, a women in enterprise conference, where I ran into my co-founder. So we worked together at McKinsey, but we didn't know each other that well from the organization. Mm. And I was like, you know, she was volunteering there. And I was like, oh, wow, this is great. This is the, the sort of thing that I would love to get involved with. Because sort of at the time at McKinsey, I was also sort of starting up um, or working with a couple of people to start up the women's initiative at the McKinsey office in Lagos. Um, and so, you know, she mentioned to me and she said, look, you know, I'd actually been bouncing around the idea of putting together a pitch competition for female entrepreneurs. But like, you know, I've been thinking about it for like the last year, but really haven't had the time to kind of like put it all together. And I was like, look, I would love, I think, to like be a part of that. So initially when we started, the idea was really just for it to be like a standalone pitch competition. It happens once every year. You know, we kind of do it on the side. Right. Um, but I think that sort of after the response that we got, we realized that there was, that we were actually touching on a nerve, which I think a lot of people were thinking about, but they really hadn't had a vehicle to express that through. And you were convinced at that point that this is an organization that is necessary. Exactly, yes. For sure. Right. So, so what do you think is preventing women from taking on these high growth businesses? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and what sort of barriers mm -hmm. have you 
yourself experienced, mm -hmm. possibly, or mm -hmm. certainly seen other women experience? Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, you know, we, I mean, we're like very, we're real consultants, right? We're mm. very much like consulting people. So the first thing is around sort of, okay, what is the problem that we think women are facing? Um, and we've sort of identified four barriers. And they all actually kind of, you know, flow into each other. Mm. Um, so the first thing is, um, I think, around sort of education. And to me, you know, yes, there is the, okay, we need better education, we need more of it. But one of the things that I think that I've realized is that, you know, work experience is also a big part of your education. One of the things that we see is oftentimes a disconnect between sort of how women are, female entrepreneurs are presenting themselves and how entrepreneurs are receiving them. Often because one of the things that I've realized is that, you know, finance is like almost its own little language, mm. right? And investors are very much people who are coming almost a lot of times from a finance perspective. And if you don't understand how to speak that language or you don't know kind of what it is that's important to them, what should I show them, what do I not need to have, what should I have in a pitch deck, what should I not have, a lot of the times it's then very difficult to get kind of people to back you. Um, so there's a big sort of education piece. Then the, no the next thing is something around sort of stereotypes. I think that, again, we're very used to African women. Yes, we always see, you know, very entrepreneurial. We mm. actually have the highest rates of female entrepreneurship in the world. But again, I don't think that we see as many African women running big businesses. Like, we just don't, not mm. at all. So there's always, like, a stereotype around this, around, you know, is it possible? You know, should I go into that? Can I really scale an organization? Maybe I should just keep it as, you know, my side hustle, something that kind of stays small but right. never really takes off. Um, I would say that the last thing is something around networks. And, you know, these problems are pretty much the same issues that, like, women across the world are facing. Right. But, but, but are, are you struck by the fact that mm. a lot of... A lot of young people, young women, mm -hmm. for example, in, in Nigeria, um, do, do not seem to want to focus on, on doing the hard work that needs to be done. I mean, it, it seems to be a general problem, and, and perhaps you could comment briefly on this, um, that, that a lot of young people seem to want to... I mean, you, you don't find people wanting to stay in school. I mean, this is something I've heard discussed uh, in a, a lot of places. They don't want to stay the, the whole course in school. They, they'd mm -hmm. rather sort of, you know, travel around or whatever and then come back at the end of the of the term and you know work around getting their results and so so we're actually Nigeria is actually churning out people who have um, qualifications but very little skills um, so I mean a couple of different things on that. So the first thing is I mean I, I think I'd push back I think okay to run a successful business there are a lot of other skills that you need other than just, um, I think, school. So mm. I think that to me, in the example that you've, you've, you've brought out, it would depend what they were doing. Because sometimes, I mean, if you think about someone like Steve Jobs, who, you know, he took, I mean, he what, did calligraphy for like part of like his degree. And that is a lot of the times kind of what inspired the um, aesthetics that you have mm. around like Apple. So I don't necessarily think that, you know, it's that, okay, people always like need to be in school, yada, yada, yada. But I think the question that, or the problem that I'm seeing is, A, a lot of people don't understand that entrepreneurship is a very, very long and very, very difficult journey. I think that because we've seen a lot of examples of people who've been able to like make money quickly, right. um, we think that that's what's going to happen for us. Um, I think that B, one of the things that I would say about a lot of um, young people is that I would like to see more people getting real work experience before they start their right. business. Like, a lot of people are starting business out of college. And the, the point is that, like, you know, a lot of the, 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 the challenge of starting a business, it's not just about having an interesting idea. It's about building an organization that right. then sort of takes that idea from your head into reality. Right. Okay. Let, let me ask mm. you this then. Um, Give us an idea of, of the, the, the women who've benefited from what you've done. Mm -hmm. Tell us about some of the projects mm -hmm. that they're working on. Yeah, no, so um, so the winner, um, our winner from um, our last pitch competition, she has um, a mobile travel app that allows people to, you know, pre-book um, experiences online. It's called Tastemakers Africa. The whole idea being that, you know, she found, she was based in the US, and she found that a lot of people wanted to travel to Africa, but they didn't really know how, they didn't know where the cool places to go, especially young people. So, you know, her travel app, so A, you know, she organizes tours. So she did one in Ghana last year where they brought about 20 people from the States. And then B, she's moving into a side where it's going to be a travel app where you can kind of go on and say, look, I'm in Nigeria. 
I want to book, you know, my hotel, my restaurant, you know, there's somewhere that will tell me, okay, these are the sort of places mm. where you can go, you can pre-book, and in some cases actually prepay, because a lot of the challenges that people have is that you're traveling around and maybe they don't take a credit card where you go or something like that, so she kind of makes that process, I think, a little bit more seamless. Right, so you support her in doing that. Mm -hmm. What do you do for her? So some of the things that we do, and a lot of the times, I mean, it depends on the entrepreneur. So for her, for example, you know, she was raising money, so she got in touch with us and said, look, you know, I'm trying to find investors who focus on this space. Is there anyone you can put us in touch with? We put her in touch with a couple of people, and one of the people who we put her in touch with led her seed round and gave her $50,000. So I think it's a, it's a little bit ad hoc. Sometimes people will say, okay, I need an introduction to more people. I mean, we have a great example of um, an organization who they make foldable ballet flats. Mm, briefly. Um, it's called Thando's Flats. Um, and she, for example, you know, might get in touch and sort of say, I'm trying to get in touch with people in the hospitality industry to sort of see if I can, you know, sell my shoes through um, hotels. We kind of go through our database, we'll find people. So a lot of it is really kind of helping them on the education piece, the finance piece, but then also kind of lending our networks to them as well. Okay. We'll take a very short break here, but when we come back, we'll be talking to Yasmin Bella Osagie about her plans for the future on the rising continent. Stay with us. Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News. We're joined by Yasmin Bella Osagie, a co-founder of She Leads Africa, who has big plans for the future of women on the continent. Let's start, start with your own personal plans for mm -hmm, the future. Mm -hmm. What are they? Um, so, I mean, definitely to continue to grow She Leads Africa. Um, I'm also going to be going back to school. Um, going to be doing um, my JD MBA, so that's a mix of a law degree and um, a business degree as well. So well, that's quite ambitious. That. It definitely is. I mean, on the business side, I think, you know, it's very obvious how we'll kind of support growing a business. And on the law side, I think at one point, I definitely would want to go into um, public policy and really kind of thinking around sort of how do you create an environment that supports the growth of business. So the law degree is definitely always good for that one. You also want to do a, a, a Harvard MBA. Actually, I'm going to Harvard Law School, so I'm doing my uh, law degree at Harvard, right. but my business degree at Stanford. So, so but are you still going to stick with the She Leads Africa? One of the big things is that, you know, obviously for us, eventually we want to move into the place where we're funding businesses ourselves. Um, so definitely in the next two to three years, we'll actually be raising a VC fund so we can put in, you know, fifty to $200,000 in some of the businesses that we see that we really like. Um, and I think that, you know, definitely going to uh, business school will kind of will, will help in terms of giving you a better network of people who are interested in investing in the continent, but also kind of teaching you some of the tools to go about, okay, so when I look at an investment, kind of what it is, is it that I'm thinking about? How do I grow an organization? Um, how do I, you know, think about supporting other people on the mm. entrepreneurial journey? So I think it just kind of gives you some strong tools with which to like approach the problem. Now, you, you, you've talked about your goal being mm. to help jumpstart sort of female entrepreneurs from small, medium enterprises mm -hmm. to pan-African industry mm -hmm. leaders. How are you going to do that? Um, so I think the first thing, I mean, it'll be a couple of things, and I think that all of them will touch on the different barriers that I spoke about. So I think, you know, with that particular goal of, you know, really getting people to create pan-African businesses, I think that the first thing would actually be finding the strong female entrepreneurs and making sure that they have what it is that they need to be successful. So is it whether hard that's to find those or, entrepreneurs? I mean, no, I actually don't think it is. I just don't think that a lot of organizations speak to women. 
So one of the things that we found with our pitch competition is about, you know, 50% of the people applied because of the focus on, on women. I think that a lot of women don't feel that, you know, the traditional sort of like going to like a farm right. yeah, 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 is a place, is something that's very welcoming for them. So I think in that they can see and identify me and my co-founder as young African female entrepreneurs, they then feel a little bit more comfortable actually like approaching us as well. Because of course the, the, um, the, the women on company boards, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there appears to be a ceiling on, on that. You know, if you've only just said about 14 percent mm -hmm. um, of board members who are women. Mm -hmm. Are you encouraging women to join these big companies or to form their own companies mm -hmm. as a way of breaking that glass ceiling? Mm -hmm. So I think when we first started out, there was a real focus on entrepreneurship. But I think that um, the mission of She Leads Africa, it's sort of it's expanded a little mm. bit in that, you know, we found that a lot of our community members, they just like the idea that we're saying women can do whatever it is that they want, whether that's starting your own business or kind of reaching um, a, a top leadership position in your already existing organization. But I would say that, you know, the focus of the organization definitely has been um, on entrepreneurs and supporting them. But, you know, we have a lot of kind of like professional women who, you know, engage with us, whether it's like online or come to our events or anything like that. So I know I've touched on this, but you've already been named as one of Forbes's 20 youngest power women mm -hmm. in Africa. You're only 26. I hope you don't mind my saying Yeah, no, 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 not at all. Leaving aside things like She Leads Africa mm -hmm. and your ambition to help others, what are your plans for the future? I mean, beyond the education that you just told us you were going to go mm -hmm. back to school and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think it would be to grow a really um, strong organization on the continent that actually supports the growth of other organizations. I think it's really, really important that we build world-class institutions on the continent that are actually started by Africans. I don't think mm. that we have enough of those yet. Um, and so, I mean, that's kind of what it is. That, so like, you're talking I about some, some sort on. of consultancy that, that goes and helps other sort of um, companies and so on to, to grow and get um, I mean, I think that it could be anything. So, I mean, in the way that She Leads Africa evolves, I think that we're a little bit, you know, finance, a little bit of a consulting firm mm. as well. It's kind of a mix of the two. But, you know, I think that the real thing is just to say that we really want to build an institution that is going to, I think, stay on and be helping and support women way, you know, after, you know, we retire or, I mean, one day we're all going to die, right? But um, so I think that that's something that's really important to me and really um, have something that has actually contributed, especially to, I think, job creation and sort of um, economic growth on the continent. And, so and do you see She point. Leads Africa mm -hmm. as the vessel for communicating this or, or you know, or, or do you see yourself going beyond that and creating something else? No, so for me, I mean, I think I'm 150% focused on like She Leads Africa for now. Um, and I, who knows what's going to happen in like 20 years, I really can't speak for that. But for the foreseeable future, I think that this is something that I really enjoy. I think it's something that needs to be done. Um, and I think that it's something that I really, I mean, I'm happy to do it. I'm happy to support support other um, young women, of course, because people kind of supported me. So I think it's important to do that as well. Yasmin, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me.